A reading from Sri Aurobindo on The Law of Sacrifice From the Synthesis of Yoga Part 1, Chapter 4 The Sacrifice, the Triune Path, and the Lord of the Sacrifice The Law of Sacrifice is the common divine action that was thrown out into the world in its beginning as a symbol of the solidarity of the universe. It is by the attraction of this law that a divinizing principle, a saving power descends to limit and correct and gradually to eliminate the errors of an egoistic and self-divided creation. The acceptance of the law of sacrifice is a practical recognition by the ego that it is neither alone in the world nor chief in the world. It is its admission that even in this much fragmented existence there is beyond itself and behind that which is not its own egoistic person, something greater and completer, a diviner all, which demands from it subordination and service. Indeed, sacrifice is imposed, and where need be, compelled by the universal world force. It takes it even from those who do not consciously recognize the law, inevitably, because this is the intrinsic nature of things. Our ignorance or our false egoistic view of life can make no difference to this eternal bedrock truth of nature. For this is the truth in nature, that this ego which thinks itself a separate independent being and claims to live for itself is not and cannot be independent nor separate, nor can it live to itself even if it would, but rather all are linked together by a secret oneness. At length, though at first slowly and partially, we learn to make the conscious sacrifice. Even in the end, we take joy to give ourselves and what we envisage as belonging to us in a spirit of love and devotion to that which appears for the moment other than ourselves and is certainly other than our limited personalities. The sacrifice and the divine return for our sacrifice then become a gladly accepted means towards our last perfection, for it is recognized now as the road to the fulfillment in us of the eternal purpose. But, most often, the sacrifice is done unconsciously, egoistically, and without knowledge or acceptance of the true meaning of the great world right. It is so that the vast majority of earth creatures do it, and when it is so done, the individual derives only a mechanical minimum of natural, inevitable profit, achieves by it only a slow, painful progress limited and tortured by the smallness and suffering of the ego. Only when the heart, the will, and the mind of knowledge associate themselves with the law of sacrifice and gladly follow it, can there come the deep joy and the happy fruitfulness of divine sacrifice. The mind's knowledge of the law and the heart's gladness in it culminate in the perception that it is to our own self and spirit and the one self and spirit of all that we give. All true love and all sacrifice are in their essence nature's contradiction of the primary egoism and its separative error. It is her attempt to turn from a necessary first fragmentation towards a recovered oneness. All unity between creatures is in its essence a self-finding, 
a fusion with that from which we have separated, a discovery of one's self in others. But it is only a divine love and unity that can possess in the light what the human forms of these things seek for in the darkness. The true unity is spiritual. Its sacrifice is a mutual self-giving, an interfusion of our inner substance. The law of sacrifice travels in nature towards its culmination in this complete and unreserved self-giving. It awakens the consciousness of one common self in the giver and the object of the sacrifice. The true essence of sacrifice is not self-immolation. It is self-giving. Its object not self-effacement, but self-fulfillment. Its method not self-mortification, but a greater life. Not self-mutilation, but a transformation of our natural human parts into divine members. Not self-torture, but a passage from a lesser satisfaction to a greater ananda. There is only one thing painful in the beginning to a raw or turbid part of the surface nature. It is the indispensable discipline demanded, the denial necessary for the merging of the incomplete ego. But for that there can be a speedy and enormous compensation in the discovery of a real, greater, or ultimate completeness in others, in all things, in the cosmic oneness, in the freedom of the transcendent self and spirit, in the rapture of the touch of the divine. Our sacrifice is not a giving without any return or any fruitful acceptance from the other side. It is an interchange between the embodied soul and conscious nature in us and the eternal spirit. For even though no return is demanded, yet there is the knowledge deep within us that a marvelous return is inevitable. The soul knows that it does not give itself to God in vain. Claiming nothing, it yet receives the infinite riches of the divine power and presence. The sacrifice may be offered to others, or it may be offered to divine powers. It may be offered to the cosmic all, or it may be offered to the transcendent supreme. The worship given may take any shape, from the dedication of a leaf or flower, a cup of water, a handful of rice, a loaf of bread, to consecration of all that we possess and the submission of all that we are. Whoever the recipient, whatever the gift, it is the supreme, the eternal in things, who receives and accepts it, even if it be rejected or ignored by the immediate recipient. For the supreme who transcends the universe is yet here too, however veiled, in us and in the world and in its happenings. He is there as the omniscient witness and receiver of all our works and their secret master. All our actions, all our efforts, even our sins and stumblings and sufferings and struggles, are obscurely or consciously known to us and seen or else unknown and in a disguise, governed in their last result by the One. All is turned towards Him in His numberless forms and offered through them to the single Omnipresence. In whatever form, and with whatever spirit we approach him, in that form and with that spirit he receives the sacrifice. The one entirely acceptable sacrifice is a last and highest and uttermost self-giving. It is that surrender made face to face with devotion and knowledge freely and without any reserve, to one who is at once our immanent self 
the environing constituent all, the supreme reality beyond this or any manifestation, and, secretly, all these together, concealed everywhere, the imminent transcendence. For to the soul that wholly gives itself to him, God also gives himself altogether. Only the one who offers his whole nature finds the self. Only the one who can give everything enjoys the divine all everywhere. Only a supreme self-abandonment attains to the supreme. Only the sublimation by sacrifice of all that we are can enable us to embody the highest and live here in the imminent consciousness of the transcendent spirit. This, in short, is the demand made on us that we should turn our whole life into a conscious sacrifice. Every moment and every movement of our being is to be resolved into a continuous and devoted self-giving to the eternal. All our actions, not less the smallest and most ordinary and trifling than the greatest and most uncommon and noble, must be performed as consecrated acts. Our individualized nature must live in the single consciousness of an inner and outer movement dedicated to something that is beyond us and greater than our ego. No matter what the gift or to whom it is presented by us, there must be a consciousness in the act that we are presenting it to the one divine being in all beings. Our commonest or most grossly material actions must assume this sublimated character. When we eat, we should be conscious that we are giving our food to that presence in us. It must be a sacred offering in a temple, and the sense of a mere physical need or self-gratification must pass away from us. In any great labor, in any high discipline, in any difficult or noble enterprise, whether undertaken for ourselves, for others, or for the race, it will no longer be possible to stop short at the idea of the race, of ourselves, or of others. The thing we are doing must be consciously offered as a sacrifice of works, not to these, but either through them or directly to the one Godhead. The divine inhabitant, who was hidden by these figures, must be no longer hidden, but ever present to our soul, our mind, our sense. The workings and results of our acts must be put in the hands of that one, in the feeling that that presence is the infinite and most high, by whom alone our labor and our aspiration are possible. For in his being all takes place. For him all labor and aspiration are taken from us by nature and offered on his altar. Even in those things in which nature is herself very plainly the worker, and we only the witnesses of her working and its containers and supporters, there should be the same constant memory and insistent consciousness of a work and of its divine master. Our very inspiration and respiration, our very heartbeats, can and must be made conscious in us as the living rhythm of the universal sacrifice. <laughs>